Hey everyone, I am so excited to be live today to chat with Paula Lees. Um, she'll be joining us here in just a moment, but happy Monday, happy um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We're going to be continuing that discussion with Miss Paula Lees. Now, she'll be um, popping into the chat here in just a second. Welcome everyone, and we will get her in here to introduce herself as soon as possible. Hello, hello everyone. I'm so excited you are here. And Miss Paul Lise um, will be joining us in just any second. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Well, good. <laughs> I love your glasses, Paul Lise. They look great. Thanks. <laughs> um, so everyone that is in the chat right now, um, my name is Sarah Krajewski. This is Paul Lise. And can you just tell us a little bit about what your year looks like as far as teaching art education? And then we'll dive into some questions that pertain to today and today's topic. Yes, yeah, so um, my name's Paula Lise and I am an art teacher just outside of Washington, DC. I teach at a dual immersion school, it's Spanish and English, and I have been virtual since March. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you have only been virtual this school year, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so you've been creating a lot of virtual lessons and I've been seeing a lot of those on your Instagram, so I'm excited to chat with you about that a little bit today. Yeah. But let's just dive right in. So today is obviously Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and you've been posting a lot of great resources, including um, some that I know you had yesterday about um, using like an apple and that as an analogy for identity. Can you just tell us a little bit about um, what you do with your students in relation to Martin Luther King Jr. Day and just tell us like what that kind of looks like for you? I, yeah, so this past, the past week I did a, a lesson on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I was really inspired by Kadir Nelson's portrait of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it's titled A Dream Deferred. And I was drawn to that because it calls attention to the fact that despite the illusion of progress, uh, Dr. King's dream has yet to be realized. And we can't continue to skirt around the issue. And the fact is that racism does still exist and we still have not achieved that Dr. King's vision of racial equality. Um, so uh, I kind of wanted to come in with that focus um, being in my in mind. And so what I had is I had my students, we did a see, think, wonder while looking at that painting and explaining to students that the painting's called a dream deferred. What does it mean to have a dream deferred? Uh, we also looked at the photography of Gordon Parks and who uh, was a photographer to just be able to have a visual and understand what segregation actually looked like. Uh, and I also appreciate the fact that his photographs are in color because that's yeah. another thing is I wanted my students to not think that this was this far away thing in the past. Yes. Uh, so the photographs I tried to find and show them and also of the March on Washington, I tried to find colored photography so that they could understand that this wasn't this antiquated historical issue, that it is, was and still is an issue uh, today. And so we also focus a lot on how our voice and our actions have power mm -hmm. and how we can use our voice to uplift and to unite and to inspire people, which is what Dr. King did, uh, for example, in many of his speeches. Or at the same time, you can also use your voice to bully and to lie and to manipulate and to right. survive. So thinking about how our voice has that power but, and also our actions. So our actions as well, we can choose to like uplift each other and to build commu community and to have, take peaceful action or we can also choose to hurt others and to destroy and to um, tear communities apart. And just being aware that because our voices and our actions do have power, what we choose to do with that power is really, really important. Um, so those were kind of the main, main takeaways. And so for the actual project, I asked my students to think about what they, how, what 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 is their vision for a better America? Yeah, and what what can they do to achieve that? So, what's their dream for that future, and what what can they do with their voice and their actions to help help that dream come become a reality? 
Yeah. Now, Paula Elise, I will say I have been using your video in my classroom with my students and it's really well made in the way that you create a lot of information for students and you're also you're giving them the the, the real words for things, right? We're not we're not like making it more simplified, but if there's a term that we're talking about, let's define it and then let's talk about it with those kids, right? Yeah. So um, I'll be sure to link to your current YouTube video um, in the Art of Ed Instagram so people can go check that out. But it includes um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. Um, it includes a lot of beautiful work by Kadir Nelson and photographs by um, Gordon Parks, which is really interesting because a lot of times when students speak about this in class, they might have a conversation of what they maybe know and, and then it might stop there, right? But as visual learners, like kids can't just picture that, right? So when I was showing them the video that you created in class, they were like, oh, th that's what it looks like to have those photographs. Wow, that's really powerful. Or I, I can't believe we see, you know, in the in the painting that Kadir Nelson did, there's um, this kind of ghostly image of the March on Washington and it's really powerful and, and students notice that. So what kind of conversations came up when you were talking with your students? Like what what questions did they have or how did you guide that conversation um, while they were talking about it? Yeah, so I think there were there were two two conversations that I had. So one one question that I asked my students is, do you think that Dr. King's dream has is a reality yet? Mm. And why or why not? And every class said no. And when I asked for examples of why, why, why were they saying that, they all brought up Black Lives Matter. Yep. And the fact that we still have to say that Black Lives Matter in and of itself shows that we've not yet achieved that. So we've also had conversations about uh, the, way, uh, the way police treat Black people in this country and also how it's just still an everyday part of American life that people need to address. And there's actually one of my students, I pulled, I pulled it up. Uh, so because we're online, we have the class during Zoom, but then yep. afterwards we have like a discussion board. I, we use Canvas so they can post their artwork and also either make a video where they talk about it or they write about it. Mm -hmm. One student, she, she wrote, uh, I do not like what happened at the White House a week ago. I feel strongly we should be different because if we're all the same, we can't learn anything new. That affects our life, our brain, and our learning. I hope you learn something from my artwork, and I hope you like it. So her artwork is, uh, it's a group of people, and they're holding a sign that says, we're all different, and we're all human. So just having that uh, conversation with students um, just kind of is something that, came up yeah yeah and and what grade was that that you did well you did the lesson with multiple grades correct yeah, yeah. and what was that student's response what how old were they so that was a fourth grader okay and I know that um I mean those of us that are elementary teachers hopefully are trying to have these conversations or at least being able to facilitate as much as possible or or even see what students ask, right? Um, yeah. Speaking for myself, when I was talking to students, I realized a lot of them didn't even know uh, like the vocabulary words of, of who is Martin Luther King Jr.? What does it mean when I say the word race, right? That that some of those basic terms that you might hear someone use in conversation, is it something that, that a first or a second grader has talked about? And that's okay, obviously, but then giving them a safe place to be able to discuss that and say, you know, the art room is a safe place for learning and for questioning. And, and, and this is where we can do this because art can be such a huge, powerful part of those conversations, right? It's, it's like hand in hand. So can you lead us through a few, um, I really love hearing that student's response because it just yeah. makes you think about how much they're thinking about it and what they're taking from that conversation, right? Um, can you share some of maybe the other student responses or um, I know you have a lot of lessons that you do and I'm gonna piggyback on the fact that um, you are one of the co-founders co for the Anti-Racist Art Teachers website, which is filled with content and resources and printouts and lessons and videos. It's like this haven of, of helpful content. Um, so Anti-Racist anti Art Teachers, um, and you created that, that resource with a few other educators. Um, but I know there are lessons on there too. So can you tell us just a few about, like a, about a few of the lessons that you've either done or that you think can be really powerful? 
Um, I think in terms of just lessons, I think a lot of what I'm trying to do is just to encourage student voice and to center uh, student voice. So I know more recently, because every year I always do a project where I ask students, what, what is it that you wish you could change in the world? And yep. throughout the years, I've done it in different ways, either through painting or they've made like uh, reusable bags or they've done printmaking. So this year being uh, digital online, I decided to do a digital version of this. So I was inspired mm -hmm. by Francesca's use of uh, Say, Say Something by Peter, Peter Reynolds, or yeah. And yep. so <laughs> uh, that project, sorry, I'm kind of, uh, so with that project, I asked students to really focus on something that they, again, wish that they could change. Um, and uh, again, just understanding that our voices are, are powerful and that it's important to teach students that they can use their voice to speak about issues that are important to them. And so what I had them do is they made a digital self-portrait that you combined both, both their use of art and words to express their feelings about a cause that's important to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we reflected on a few questions. So what, what is it that you would like to see change in the world? How can your voice change the world? And why is it important to use your voice? as well as how can we inspire others to use our voice and how can you use your voice to create a more just society? So those were some of the questions that we, we explored with that. And um, so they used, we used Pixlr, which is an online free kind of Photoshop version. And mm -hmm. they were excited to use that because they had never, never used that before. Yes. It looked at uh, some of the posters on amplifier art you're not familiar with them oh, okay so they're a nonprofit design lab and they build art to amplify the most important movements of our time and they have a website amplifier.org so we looked at some of those digital designs and posters for inspiration so in addition to reading uh say something we also read i'm one a book of action which is also written by or illustrated by peter reynolds and written by susan verde and introducing students to not only using their voice and their art, but also taking action and thinking about what things can they actually do to make a change, um, in addition to just using their voice to speaking and to speak up. Right. I mean, so there's so much to unpack there, Paula Lees. I feel like you, have, you are filled with um, those questions and those conversations that students feel like I, I think at this point, after having you as an art teacher, they know that this is the kind of things that you're going to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a couple of comments here in the chat about how it is so important that we're centering both our projects and our discussion around our students' voice, right? Because this is our topic for today is discussing how to find and, and encourage their identity and also just to, to center their voice and to make them understand how they can use their art and their voice for, for change, right? For good. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll chat just a little bit more about that too, but I just wanted to confirm for a few buddies in the chat here that yes, the site is anti-racist art teachers um, and it is a Google site. So you'll see like google.com or Google we, site, something or other, but right. <laughs> we, we have, we recently purchased a domain name. So it's antiracistartteachers.org. Beautiful. Okay. Antiracistartteachers.org. I use it all the time. It is um, yeah. <laughs> incredibly helpful. And um, speaking to just all of the people that have helped to create that um, content and that resource, any person that I've reached out to has been incredibly helpful. Like even Paul Elise will vouch on Monday. I messaged her and I was like, hey, a kid said, said this. Uh, well, in fact, we can even talk about it. A student had mentioned that um, that the word black, when you were talking to somebody saying that someone was black was racist. And so I talked to Paul Lees and I was like, well, I didn't know 100% how to handle that situation. Can you help me? So we kind of built this community where we can encourage each other to help solve that problem. So um, Paul Lees was able to help me to say that, that it's not a racist term, but we can refer to people in that way and what race is and introduce those things to my students. So I found that incredibly helpful. Um, and I know that any other person I would message that is part of that group would, would do the same thing. Um, okay, so let's talk just a little bit more about um, 
how you specifically center student voice, right? Because that is essentially your teaching philosophy. You as an art educator, if I'm taking the words out of your mouth, know yeah. that that's really important to you, right? So what kinds of things do you do to center student voice specifically when you're teaching? Uh, so I think the first part of that is just uh, as teachers, sometimes especially teaching institutions have, mm -hmm. are kind of stuck in more traditional, traditional ways of teaching and learning. And I think one of the first things that teachers need to do is they need to be comfortable with letting go mm -hmm. uh, and letting go. Because I think a lot of times teachers are seen as the ones holding all of the knowledge and all of the power. Yep. And it comes this, like, I'm here, the leader, I have all the knowledge, I have all the power, and you all just sit here and listen to what I have to say. <laughs> and that's not, uh, to me, that's not what education is about. And I think the first thing is just really letting, letting that go and giving students the power and the space, as well as being open to the fact as a teacher, you, you we don't know everything. Right. Uh, and we can learn with our students and from our students. So really creating like the making an art room that's engaging and liberating for your students is really important. Um, and also, if you expect your students to open up to you, and to be vulnerable in these discussions, you yourself also have to do that. So Absolutely. sharing your own stories and your own narratives with students is going to help to build those relationships and that uh, as well. Yeah, completely. I mean, but w with anything that we do in art education, modeling, whether it's a technique or whether it's a conversation is like a huge part of what we do. But I think you're right, is that it's it's even modeling how to not sure, like, model how you don't really know how to talk about something or model that you're nervous or model that you are, uh, you know, you're questioning something, you're not really sure, hey, what do you all think about this, right? And so teaching kiddos how to be able to talk about that is, is like the best place to do it is in the art room, right? I mean, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, somebody wrote in the chat, the they brought up pedagogy of the press by Freire. And also, mm. I would recommend um, teaching to transgress by bell hooks is also another good uh, resource. Can you say that one one more time, Paulies? I it's I believe it's teaching to transgress by bell hooks. I'm pretty okay. Sure <laughs> okay, the title. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to post those yeah. in our story as well. So all the content that we talk about that people are looking to link for, um, they can find afterwards as well. Yes, there's there's lots of resources, including individuals that can help share. There's obviously like anti-racist art teachers that we can use as well. Um, but also just the fact that that we're talking right and showing our students this isn't there's not a simple clean beautiful answer for this right this is an ongoing conversation um so i know you were also doing um the lesson the color of us and you did say something um and you did some with even really young students like your kindergarten um students right so what has it been like to talk with those really young kids and how do you feel like you can best start that conversation with with really young students I think that it's important that we do start young. Um, a lot yeah. of times uh, people will hold off on having these difficult conversations with elementary students in particular because they think, oh, they're too young, they don't understand. But actually, um, Dr. Bettina Love mentioned, I was listening to her, she gave a, a speech recently for as part of a cohort that I am in. And she mentioned how actually children by the time they reach middle school high school they've already kind of cemented their ideas right so yeah. it's important to have these conversations with students at a younger age when they're uh, more able to kind of listen and to have uh, be able to process a little bit more before they think before they start thinking in only one one way Right. Yeah. Before it gets kind of like yeah. cemented, like you're saying, yeah. in, in that decision, it's essentially giving them a chance to form their opinions and have discussions yeah. about it in a, in a safe way. So, yeah. I mean, for for younger students, I mean, we can read books, we can have that conversation. Right. But what do you feel like has been one of the more uh, successful or powerful ways to speak to your elementary kids when you're talking about issues that are big and important, but can be can feel a little vulnerable to address? 
Yeah, I think um, just using, again, vocabulary and defining vocabulary. Mm -hmm. and I just believe in being in being honest as well. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, for my the kindergarten lesson that we do, we talk about how we're all different and unique and that we need to see each other's differences in order to understand who we are and who, how we all kind of fit in to one another. So we talk about our skin color and race as that. And because um, growing up, I know that I did not match, my skin color didn't match that peach crayon, the flesh skin color that was right. in the box. So it was very frustrating for me, especially in elementary school, yeah. uh, kind of using those predetermined limited colors that were available. And we're actually all, we're all shades of brown and we can encourage our students to uh, learn how to uh, mix their own colors. So what I do is with that project, we start off by reading uh, Katie Kissinger's, the, I forget what it's called, hold on. Um, <laughs> I have it right here. Sorry. I believe, you have one oh, of the all questions. the colors we are. <laughs> oh yeah, perfect. Katie Kissinger. And so this book, it's more of like a scientific, uh, oh, yeah. understanding of what of what our skin color is and it's based on like our ancestry our genetics and the sun as well as melanin so again mm -hmm. just kind of uh breaking it down more for students and understanding that our skin color is just like a it's just scientific fact right and not yeah. just putting all of these different emotions and feelings in and in terms of just addressing it at a younger age because at the, it's really important that we can't, that we stop that idea that pretending, I don't want teachers and students to continue thinking that everyone is the same and then we don't have to talk about that. Right, because right. Race is just one part of who we are, but also understanding that it's not all of who we are. Correct. Um, and because we do live in a diverse world, kids are exposed to multiple different a variety of people and uh, whether it's in person or on TV or in the media, they need to kind of understand where, what those differences are and how we all kind of fit in together. Completely. So, and, and sort of essentially, um, and, and I even know on your website that there are um, like ways to respond to students or um, different sort of questions about like uh, being colorblind or, you know, like taking that terminology and seeing why it's important to, to push back against that and teach our students to celebrate our differences um, and to learn more about about those instead of just seeing a difference and shutting it down from there. A couple of quick things too that I noticed um, in the chat was that um, one individual said that many students of color are already having these conversations at home, right? So of course it, it only seems right that we, sh we should all be having these conversations and that it shouldn't just be the responsibility of um, those families to, to have those conversations when we can of course show and model what that looks like to um, teach love and respect for everyone. Um, and then also um, Janet Taylor here is asking about any other recommendations for books, because I know you already mentioned a couple really great ones. Um, I know you said teaching to transgress um, pedagogy of the oppressed. These might be more for like educators, right. To, mm -hmm. to educate themselves, but also um, I mean, we read children's books all the time in class. So what are some of your favorites besides, um, I love the, all the colors we are. I like that there's the science behind that because I think it, it breaks it down in a different way than mm -hmm. it's a little less, I don't know, fluffy maybe, right? It's a little more like factual. So we get it. Um, and I love that part too. So what other books do you, do you love to start the conversation with them? Yeah, with, with that lesson in particular with uh, kindergarten, another book that I use is The Skin You Live In, and I believe mm -hmm. by um, Michael Tyler, uh, as well as uh, I Love My Hair, which is mm -hmm. by Natasha um, Tarpley, and also Hair Love, which is yep. um, the more yeah recent, also the video short story of it. Perfect. 
I love it. And I think visually, um, especially young kids can relate to a story too to start the conversation first. So if anybody that's watching is a little nervous to have these conversations with students, remember that you can start by showing them something and get their sort of their juices flowing a little bit and then go from there, right? Um, and, and that it's okay to get things wrong and it's okay to be nervous because this is what helps students and yourself grow and learn, right? Um, so how do you feel, um, if we're talking about bigger social justice issues, for example, your student that responded in, is it Canva, right? Yeah. Um, and had yeah. said that they didn't, you know, they were hurt and didn't agree with what was happening at the Capitol. So what, how do you facilitate those kinds of conversations, those bigger conversations with your students to make them feel like they can be safe enough to talk to you about that? Now, we kind of already went over this a little bit, making those meaningful relationships with your students. But I feel like it, this is such an important topic that any little piece of advice you have to help um, make your students feel comfortable to talk about this is going to be really helpful. So is there anything else you can kind of um, suggest to be able to make kids be able to talk about that? Yeah, I think that um, just in general, just critical, to me personally, I think criti having critical conversations and discussion yeah. in the classroom is just as important as the art making. So making sure that you're leaving time and space for that and not just trying to fit it in into five minutes. Um, so giving them that opportunity to open up and have a discussion. And if it even being open to the fact that it might last the whole whole class yep. time is <laughs> fine. Yeah, uh, not every art class has to be art making, right? Um, and yes. I think that so a critical conversations, any discussion about the ways that injustice if, impacts our lives and our and society, and those conversations explore relationships between identity and power, mm -hmm. and they structures that privilege at some at the expense of others and really helping students think through actions that they can take to create a more just and equitable world. So usually what I do is I let students take the lead in these yeah, conversations. Yeah. I think as educators, and that goes back to just centering student voices, it's just asking questions and letting yeah. them guide and lead the conversation. So thinking about what questions to ask your students um, and then having them really take take the lead and take the hold. So uh, like example with that, what that had, student had said and in another class last week, another student brought up the white privilege and included the definition of white privilege in his artwork and talked about how what uh, has been happening lately is a direct result of white privilege and the fact that white people need to take, um, need to understand that this is something that they need to do and that they need to address, that it's a yeah. white person issue. So that, again, that was a fourth grader who brought, they brought that up themselves and that led the conversation. Uh, and we were able to have a much larger discussion about that topic because I gave them that space, right, to do that. Absolutely. And I asked them those questions, because that was the result of, uh, like, do you think Martin Luther King's dream has been realized? That's that's the question I asked, and that was a response that then led to further, further discussion. So just being able to create a space for your students where they feel comfortable engaging in that dialogue is important, and also providing them with vocabulary and yes. tools. Yes. Um, so, so that be able to have those conversations because even anytime I've been new at a school, I usually will do like some kind of self portrait project with students. And I sometimes notice that even the, my fourth or fifth graders, when, because I know I can talk a little bit about my layers of identity. But yes, one please. of the things yeah, that we <laughs> ask them is to uh, identify their race. And a sure. lot of them will look at me like, what is race? And uh -huh. you would think to me by fifth grade that they would have already been introduced to that vocabulary, but they haven't. So just being able to provide those definitions for students so that they can understand what it is that we're uh, talking about. 
more. Yeah, completely. So. Well, okay, so up next, I want to talk about your layers of identity because I think yeah. that visual is really helpful. But I thought of a couple of things that I just wanted to mention too. Um, I've been leaning on you a lot this week, Paula Lise, as I've been like introducing this to my students and having these conversations because I, I, I like having a little bit of collaboration for like, does this feel appropriate? How does this work? Because um, quite honestly, we haven't done a project like this before, had these conversations. Um, so I, I, it's helpful to have resources in order to, to help um, I'll help you, right? So um, something that you already said, but I just want to reiterate was that vocabulary is important and teaching your kids that first so that they can understand what they're hearing and what they might question. Because um, the first day, admittedly, when I started talking about this, I was like, we're going to play the video. It's good. And then all of a sudden I realized we kind they sort of didn't know what we were talking about when I would reference something or when they would question something. So don't underestimate the power of giving them their content and their vocabulary first and yeah. then secondly i love how you're talking about the the questioning um because i think a, a teacher's tendency sometimes is to um to take the lead right and as we as i'm seeing a lot in the in the chat here too is to let them take the lead but that the teacher might feel like they have something to share and then they go for it but it, going against your reflexes and then just questioning back to the student and saying why do you feel that way or I wonder why you noticed that or something to just literally turn the question back to them is going to get a way stronger response, which was a huge part in your, your um, helpful advice to me in, in um, teaching those students. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so now can you tell us a little bit about your layers of identity and how you introduce that to your students? Yeah, so uh, with kindergarten, the self-portrait unit, we just talk more about our physical appearance and what we look like and how we're different, how we're the same, and why and why that why that matters and why it doesn't matter um, as being part of our identity. But as students get older, I want them to understand that our appearance and is not all who we are, right? Right. So, like our and I say this a lot, but our race is not, when you identify as your race, that's not all of who you are. So for right. example, uh, if you're introducing an artist who, for I'm Puerto Rican, so if I were to introduce another Puerto Rican artist, their work isn't all about being Puerto Rican and what that kind of experience right. is. That's only a part of, a small part of their identity and their uh, intersectionality. And it's important that students start to kind of understand who they are and what those different parts of their identity are and how those impact the way that they perceive the world and the way that others perceive them. Yes. And so this can be, uh, when you talk about the idea of intersectionality or positionality, those can be very complicated topics yeah. for uh, younger students to understand. So what I had done is, I broke it down into uh, talking about different layers of our identity. So I used an apple as a visual reference. So we talked about talk about how the skin of the apple is how we look. So that's how other people see us. So that's like our physical appearance, our hair, our race, our age, our height, our clothing. And that's just on the surface. Right. And but we also have on the inside, we have like the flesh of the apple. And those are more things that you do, so your actions, your interests, your talents, your skills, your abilities. So with that flesh, that's how uh, maybe other classmates might see you or teammates or your teachers. And then deep down all the way inside is, the, is our core. So our core is really what we think. So what we believe, our values, our culture, our traditions, our hopes, our dreams, our feelings. And that inner layer is the hardest to get to and not yeah. everyone's going to see that layer. So that would be like more close friends and family. So what I have them do, we talk about the three layers of our identity and I have them brainstorm the parts that fit under each. So like, how would you describe how you look? How would you describe your, what are some of your interests, your talents and things as well as then the hardest one is that core. So really yeah. thinking about, and having them reflect on themselves, like what is it that they truly believe? What's really, really important to them? Mm -hmm. And have to start writing that and then visualizing that. So how can they then take those words and those ideas and make it a visual and make a visual representation of that? And so I had them do a self-portrait and 
have them include at least one or more aspects from each layer in their Ooh. self portrait in the I end. Love that. Yeah. And again, being able for them to then have conversations and talk about their work throughout the process and also at the end. And by doing that, they also get to know each other a little bit better. And I also get to know them a little bit better because especially like that core, we don't, like I said at the beginning, that's not something that is easily seen or known. So being able yeah. to share what it is that's truly, truly important to them in their core uh, and sharing that with others and me helps us all to kind of build that community and build those relationships, which then in turn help help aid having those critical conversations and discussions about other topics throughout throughout the school year. Completely. I mean, talk about making meaningful connections, right? If you create a project where a student has to explain who they are entirely through their work, not only will you get to know them better, as you're saying, but also it just helps them understand what what art is going to look like for them, right? What does art making mean? And, and why is it an important way to express more about them? And I think um, I know we today just with some of our conversation with MLK, we have been speaking a little bit about race in particular, but this kind of lesson isn't obviously just about race, right? But it is about themselves as a person and what their identity is. So um, I think that's something that's important to notice too, Paulies, is that your teaching philosophy of centering student voice is so much more complex than those physical characteristics, obviously, right? Um, are there any other uh, fun sort of like conversation starters or any other projects that you find really successful to help you find um, those student-centered projects or ways to have those conversations with your students um, about just bigger issues in general um, that you'd like to share? Um. Well, I like I said, I've done I've done a few, so yeah. it depends on uh, what it what it's done. So I've done uh, different versions similar to the one that I just did with the digital version, where they digitally created a self portrait that uh, expressed something that they wish they could change in the world. Yeah. I've done a similar project where they uh, kind of had that image. They created it on fabric and oh, cool. made a reusable bag. And we then made this so that the idea is when they're using the reusable bag and out in public, they're in a way publicly uh, yeah. explaining, saying what it is that they believe in and sharing out. That lesson also tied into uh, an environmental unit where we talked about the impact of plastic on mm -hmm. the environment. Uh, and again, having that connection on not only what can they say, but what can they do. So when we talk about that unit, we talk about the different actions that they can take to help prevent uh, plastic pollution and mm -hmm. so reducing, reusing, recycling. And we also, so that project is they make reusable bags. Cool. <laughs> so in order for the idea that they're then reducing their carbon footprint because they're not using those plastic bags. And my mom's a a seamstress she yes. makes clothes so i have a ton of spare uh scrap fabric from from her over the years that i use to to make those bags uh, nice so, <laughs> yeah and uh, another version that i've done is similar but then having them not rely on words which can sometimes be a little bit more tricky so i've done that project with uh fifth and sixth graders where again they are taking that issue that topic that's important to them, but then thinking about how can they express how they feel about it mm -hmm. only through images alone. So that yeah. one's a little bit more, they have to really think about, okay, how can I visually represent and communicate my ideas without having to rely on, on, on words necessarily. So that one I've done also as a printmaking unit. And we look at some of the artwork of Kathy Colwitz as well. I am writing, I'm writing so many things down as you speak. I've got like my little <laughs> list of notes of things I want to look up. Kathy Kolwitz. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so I know a lot of other um, individuals are really sharing that they love that at Apple analogy and really the whole, I, the whole conversation about making sure our students are the very center of um, our projects and art education, right? Because why else, why else are we doing it if not for them, right? And to try to make them better people, ideally through learning art. Um, so 
before we go and before we do our little like holographic sticker giveaway situation, um, <laughs> friendly reminder for everyone that's looking for um, content from Paula Lee's. There are lots of things on antiracistartteachers.org. Um, and there, I know, are lots of other educators and resources that you can use to have these kinds of conversations with students in your own classroom. So can before I do our little question at the end for who wants this really cool sticker, um, can you tell us any parting words that you have for us about moving forward through the school year or um, maybe a little challenge for some teachers that are a little nervous to get started with some bigger conversations? What would you like to share with us um, some advice for moving forward, Paula Lise? Yeah, I think um, don't be afraid to have students take the lead and just kind of start, get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable and just let letting go a little bit. And yeah. also with that, not being afraid to have those discussions, regardless of how long they take. So most of my, in the normal school year, when we're in the physical building, most of my projects take a minimum of 10 to 15 weeks. So mm -hmm. students only maybe make three, maybe four physical works of art throughout the year. And I think, especially at elementary school, a lot of people, when I first come in, they'll, they're kind of shocked. shocked <laughs> at that because they expect, especially at the elementary level, you expect to just kind of keep pumping out artwork. Yep. And really, making sure, at least for me, I focus more on that process over the product, right? Yep. And their students spend 15 weeks on a project where they really dive deep and they yes. really get to have those meaningful, important conversations with one another. They really get to reflect. They really get to kind of uh, engage a lot further with that. To me, ultimately, that's more impactful and meaningful and I also feel that they're going to remember that experience more yeah uh and they're also more proud of it's something that they take great pride in yes. uh, at the end and also another thing for me is that when I share hang student artwork up I'll hang everyone's up of course <laughs> so yeah I make sure that if I am going to put up a display that I'm not just picking like the best looking ones. I will put, mm -hmm. I'll put everyone's up uh, just to make sure that everyone, because everyone has put the time into it. Everyone's been working hard and everyone's work needs to be highlighted and appreciated. And I, that's probably the one thing that I miss the most is yeah. the sense of pride, especially the first couple of months is kind of bare in the hallways at my school. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> as they've created the project and they hang them up, like the they're so excited, and mm -hmm. all the whole school is excited, and the whole school engages and looks at what they're doing and they talk about it, and it really becomes a way for them all to kind of uh, come together and and share their work. And actually, uh, this past Saturday, our PTA holds a MLK event every year. So as part of that, all of the work that they had made this past week online, I compiled them all into a, a video. And Whoa. I have MLK's speech kind of over top with the images of their own work. So I explained to them like, oh, this past week, we got to look at the art of Kadir Nelson and listen to the speech and see how he visually represented uh, King's vision and dream. So let's now take your artwork because you're all artists and, uh, share that and then they so I had a lot of kids come on their Saturday morning and they were so oh, excited yeah. <laughs> for, for that video just to see uh, each other's work and to be inspired and I think that that's also really important and another thing that I try to do uh, is not refer to my students as students I refer to them as artists so I always yeah. say hello artists so making sure that they know and understand that they all are, are artists and that mm -hmm. their voices matter and their thoughts matter. And I want to amplify what it is that they have to say and show me and do. And ultimately that's kind of what, what I want to, to do as a art educator. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's so much there, I love it. <laughs> I see, um, because that sounds like a really amazing
amazing event. Can you tell us more about what that PTA event is? And will you be sharing the video? Because I want to see what your students uh -huh. created with the content that sounds really beautiful. Oh, well, I'm not sure if I can share because not oh, everyone- Oh, student has, artwork. Yeah, the permissions. But I did post some of the student artwork that did have, um, have per parent permission. They're on my Instagram stories right now. So you can see right. a, few, a few of the artwork pieces that students created and um, responded to. So, Perfect. yeah. Nice. What else do they do at the event usually? So normally, traditionally, there's been some kind of collaborative art project. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was, we weren't able to do that because it was online. Although I did try something completely new on Saturday. Thanks to Abby, if she's listening to this, she introduced me to Jamboard. Yeah, and girl. <laughs> so I had them all, I made like a page. So I said like kindergarten's dream, first grade's dream. And I had them, uh, that was interesting. <laughs> like, <laughs> Should, all you repeat it? All at the same time on the same. So it was like a virtual collaborative digital um, experience. So that That's was cool. That was yeah. I love it. It's it's pushing us to try things we have never tried before. I love it. Abby just said love it. I assume you're talking about Abby Shakai from Art of Man. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, Abby from um, Anti-Racist Art. Oh, Art. Abby Bird. Yeah, she's Bird. the one. She had introduced me. Yes. Uh, nice. Boards recently. I love it. I love it. Okay, well, that's amazing. And I want to see all those things. <laughs> Um, yes, both of us are teaching elementary. Some other friends are saying they love Jamboard. Okay, so um, the last thing we're going to do really quick is to get your hands on one of the holographic stickers. Here's your question. So in the chat, I need you to write the answer to this question. And the first answer that I see that is correct is going to be mailed one of these really cool like rainbow AWU palette stickers. So here is the question. Let me look. <laughs> uh, okay. Paula Lees is the co-founder of what website that provides culturally relevant resources to art teachers? So just list the website. It's okay if you don't have the .org or .com. What is the website? We've mentioned it a few times in the chat today. Who's going to be first? <laughs> this part is always so suspenseful, so I'll just show the rainbows while we're waiting right now. Yay! Okay, M-E-E. -E. I'm, that's the first one that I saw. Is that the first one you see, Paul Elise? Yes. M E, yeah. okay, three E's. O, oh my gosh, O W. <laughs> now I'm like working at the same time. I E L. Yay. Okay, thank you, friend. I will message you and get you a super cool sticker. And thank you, everybody, for joining the chat today. We really appreciate you all being here and being part of this conversation as we move forward to give our students the best education we possibly can. Thank you so much, Paula Lees. I appreciate all your knowledge and your willingness to share. You're awesome. Have a great Monday, everybody. Bye. Bye.